message. So um, buckle up. We've got a lot to cover. Um, and I'll just say this quickly. Um, I am glad you're well rested today because it's going to be a lot of great information. Um, but also, if you're a life group leader today, I know some of your groups have reached out and just said your group has um, started to take the Sunday sermon and you guys are discussing it and studying it more deeply. If your group is that way, um, you may need my notes from today to take to your group. Just email me, uh, reach out on Facebook or whatever it is, and I will send these to you because it's a lot. Okay, here's where I'm going to start. Last week, um, Pastor Tanner spoke. And it was a wonderful message. Um, Linda and I were out of town. We were visiting Jake in California. He's working at a Christian retreat center out there. And uh, we had a great time seeing him. And uh, while we were there, we're staring at, staying in an Airbnb and we're watching you guys online. And uh, don't you just love online church, by the way? Um, so thankful for what they do, and they do it faithfully every single week, and we were the recipients of their ministry. Um, but th we're sitting there watching uh, Pastor Tanner teach us, and it was so good, and I knew I, knew I needed to ca try to capture his heart and preach a second message along that heart. Um, so here's kind of the idea that he threw out there. How do we have a relationship with Jesus? How do we walk with Jesus? And how do we have it to where it's an actual friendship between us and him? And this isn't just a church experience. It's not just a religion. Amen. How do we do that? And, and uh, one of the illustrations that he used that I thought was so helpful is he was talking about baseball. And I'm going to try with a sports illustration, um, if you know me. Anyway, um, World Series just happened, so you might be thinking about baseball. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything more. I'm just getting myself in trouble. But there's a home plate, right? And, and people go up to it, and they swing a bat, and they try to hit a home run at the World Series. He, he used that illustration last week and said, if you walked up to that plate and tried to hit a home run at the World Series, your chance of doing that is zero percent. Um, you just couldn't, right? Like, there's it, it, just no way. And he said, now don't say that you're going to try to go up and hit that. Uh, it won't work. But you could train to do it. And so he threw out this idea of, hey, why don't you train? Don't try. And he brought that over to the Christian life and said, instead of saying, I'm going to try to have a friendship with Jesus, a lot of times that's code for us if I'm not going to do anything. So how about you train? Because in the baseball world, you can at least get yourself into the batting cage, yes? In the baseball world, you can at least listen to your coach as he tries to coach you. There are things that you can do, and in the Christian life, it's the same way. And a lot of times when we say try, what we're doing is we're giving ourselves permission to not even seek God, seek God, and fail, and um, Stop reading the Bible for a few weeks and then repent and start again and receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ paid for you on the cross by his shed blood and get up and go again. God says, seek me and you will find me when you seek after me with all of your heart. And, and, and he talked about this little lie that sometimes works its way into us of, of like, well, God understands, right? God understands that having a friendship with Jesus is hard. God understands that it's hard to pray to somebody that you can't see. God understands that I'm not a reader and reading the Bible is hard. And God understands that I'm busy. And doesn't God understand? And, and Pastor Tanner said, no, he doesn't. No, God expects. God doesn't exempt you from following Jesus. And, and see what, what, what that is, is that's a misunderstanding of the grace of God. Like we believe in the grace of God that picks us up every time we fall, yes? Forgives us and, 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 and takes away our shame. Like that's, that's the grace of God. But the grace of God does not mean that he doesn't expect you to seek him. And sometimes we let that kind of an idea in. And in a church like ours, um, a church like ours where we teach so much about grace, sometimes that, that um, misunderstanding happens all the more. I'll give you a phrase to just kind of drive it home. God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. He expects us to fail and to be forgiven, but he expects us to follow 
And in a church like ours where we preach about grace so much, and by the way, we should preach about grace so much, right? It, it's our name after all, Grace Fellowship Church. But beyond that, it's our, it's our mission See to it that no one misses the grace of God, which we take from Hebrews 12, 5. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Why? Because there are so many people that are stuck in religion and trying to earn things with God and trying to achieve his favor. Or they think that they bring something to God. You don't bring anything to God. Jesus brought everything to God. And you're the recipient of his love. And all that earning and all that trying, that path doesn't work. And even if you self-delude yourself to think that it worked, you become a self-focused religious Pharisee who is cruel and cold and tends to judge other people. And that's what Jesus called us against, yes? So we are saved by grace through faith. And that is, this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We preach grace unapologetically, but we preach grace so unapologetically that you could get the wrong idea. You could get the wrong idea that everything is grace and you don't even need to seek. But you do need to seek because that's a, that's a misunderstanding Grace does not exempt you. Grace does not pre-excuse you. Grace expects you. So here's the questions um, that I realized I needed to go after that you had asked as part of you asked for it. Uh, Here are the questions. Do we have to follow God's sexual standard? It's an easy slow ball pitch, right? Easy one. What if my politics don't line up with scripture? Why do Christians seem to follow God on Sunday, but not so much Monday through Saturday? Is God tolerant and understanding of my sin? Does God just kind of get me, right? So I tried to summarize all those questions together to give us some focus. And here's what I came up with. What if culture's morals don't match God's morals? Does God just understand? I think that's a lie that has come in for many of us? And the answer to that question is no, he doesn't. Let's be blunt and honest. No, he doesn't. We like to say this phrase here, it's okay to not be okay. At this church, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be a mess today in the family of God. Amen. It's okay to be broken. It's okay if this is your first time back to church in years. It's okay if you're here and your heart's barely here. It's okay if you feel so uh, caught up in sin, you're not even sure Jesus loves you anymore. It's okay to not be okay. But the second phrase is so important, but the father loves you too much to leave you there. It's okay to not be okay, but the father loves you too much to leave you there. And so he expects you to seek. And he expects you to live for Jesus and to find him. There's a lie that we believe The lie is that the American dream is your greatest good and your greatest happiness. And so if God loves you, he will give you the American dream. And I am pro-America, by the way. I love what God has given us in this country. I love what we have inherited that other people have paid for. I love the freedom that we have. There's so much that I love about America, but there is something in our culture that is insidious and is part of the world. And it comes in and says, hey, there's this dream, right, where you get the romantic partner that you want, and you get as much sex as you want, and you get as much money as you want, and you get the career achievements that you've dreamed of. You also get the kids, and you get the white picket fence, And you get the car that you want, you get the boat that you want, you get the vacations that you want, and you get the retirement that you want, and you get the guarantee from God that there will be no cancer in your life or the life of your kids. And then we sit back and expect our Father in heaven to provide that. And that is a lie. God has promised to love you, and he has not promised you the American dream. And that's hard. Um, so we, we come to the sexual ethic of scripture and we say, shouldn't I be able to sleep with whoever I want and whoever I'm attracted to? 
regardless of what the word of God says, when it comes to our addictions, we say, doesn't God understand that this temptation is just so great for me right now in this moment that I have to give into it? Doesn't God just understand? No. When it comes to my money, isn't my money for me so I can take care of myself in all the ways that I want to? Isn't it mine? Don't, doesn't it belong to me? No. When it comes to the truth, isn't culture's version of right and wrong the ultimate because we're so modern and we're so smart? And God's word and God's ethics are so, so old and so 2,000 years ago. No. Do I get to treat this life like it's all there is and scramble to get all I can and make it all about me? No. God does not just understand. Luke chapter 6, verse 47. Are you offended yet? I'll try harder. Luke 6, 47. This is Jesus speaking, and he's going to lay this out really, really clearly for us in a picture. And if you're a church person, you've heard this about a thousand times, and your temptation is going to be to let this just go past you. Nope, enter into it like it's the very first time, and I want you to pay extra attention. Look what Jesus says. He says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Say, then follows it then follows it because that's the, that's the uh, important point. It is like a person building a house who digs deep. Say digs deep, digs deep. They, they dig deep and they lay the foundation on solid rock. And when the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. And again, you might know this one. It's like you build the house on the rock. It's nice and solid. And when the storm comes, you're going to survive the storms of this life. And that all makes sense to us. But he's like, dig deep. What in the world does that mean? So when Linda and I were in California, we were visiting Jake and his girlfriend. I just said that. <laughs> um, we had a great visit, and they took us out on a hike, and they're at this Christian retreat center in the Redwoods of California. It was beautiful. Oh, yeah. And they took us on this hike up onto this mountain, and as we were hiking along, one of the things I noticed was the trails were dirt, but every once in a while, you look down and you realize you weren't just walking on dirt, you were walking on stone. Why? Because we're on a mountain. And so the dirt is just the surface level. You've got to dig underneath it to get to the stone that's there. And Jesus is like, you can build on stone. And the stone is his word, of course. And when the storms of life come, you will survive. So verse 49, then he compares it. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground, right on the dirt, without a foundation at all. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. And so Jesus compares two different people. And what you've got to notice is that both of them hear God's word. Both of them get the words of Jesus. And they listen. And they study and they get more insight. Both of these people are church people. It's only the first one who obeys it. It's only the first one who takes what they're learning and what they're hearing and they live that life. That's the difference. And you can build on sand and you can build on your own way. You know what's interesting, like, like imagine if, if you're the builder, right? And you're, you're building your foundation and you've got the beams and all this kind of stuff. And, and when you're going down to the rock, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to adjust to the shape of the rock that's there, yes? It, it, the rock won't move. You move. You'll adjust to it in order to get a nice solid house. That's what the process is. It doesn't adjust, you adjust. When it comes to sand, guess who does the adjusting? The sand does, right? Because like I can build whatever I want and the sand is just going to give way. I am more solid. The sand is going to give way. I'm going to make the sand in my image and then it's all going to fall apart. We do that with God. We, we come to God's word and, and who bends, guys? Does he bend or do you bend? Does he bend or does the philosophy of this culture and this world, does it bend? So often we're like, well, I want Jesus for salvation and for heaven, but I really want to bring my philosophy to it. And I'm going to live my life based on that. And our world starts to collapse and we don't know why. 
And Jesus has warned us. Jesus has told us that if you expect him to bend and you're the one who stays in place, then you will build something that's in your image where you are a little God. You, you'll build life in your image and it will, it will lead to what that kind of life leads to. And it's not to stability and to strength. Now, I, wanna, I just want to say this really quickly before we move on. Um, I am not trying to say your th- salvation is in question when it comes to building your life according to Christ. So let me give you another verse just to clarify this. This is 1 Corinthians 3.12, and it's another verse about building. And this is the Apostle Paul talking. Watch carefully what he says. He says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, Gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. So he gives you kind of uh, 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 two, two sets here, and some of them are really solid. And the wood, hay, and straw isn't going to survive fire, right? But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, verse 14, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved. Say, will be saved. They will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So there will be some, and they will find Jesus, and they will reach out to him for forgiveness, but they will build their life their way. And when it comes down to it, they will suffer great loss. Are we saying they won't go to heaven? That's not what that verse says. It says that they will escape as though through the flames, but they will suffer great loss. We're talking about the life that you build. We're talking about the glory that you give God. We're talking about the way that you love other people. Hebrews 2, 3 is an interesting verse. It says, consider Jesus who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Do you remember the hostility Jesus suffered? so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I love how he puts that. And I used to read it with a laugh every single time. Because of course you could say, I haven't died yet. You know, it's like I'm struggling with my sin, Lord, but you haven't died yet. I know. But, but get underneath what he's trying to say. He's trying to say every time we come to Jesus and Jesus says, hey, listen, this is my word for you. This is my will for you. I want you to change your life in this way. Immediately inside of us, we're like, but I'm going to suffer if I do that. Right? Don't we? Like we know the pain we'll feel if we go down his road. And he's like, when you're thinking about that suffering and that pain that you're about to go through, get perspective on it. Because Jesus suffered a whole lot more for you. It's just so direct. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet shed your blood. And so that verse kind of got me thinking about the early church because they also suffered. Um, And so I'm going to tell you about the early church right now. I'm going to take you through a little history lesson on the early church because um, there's just something about those guys. Uh, The first 300 years of the church as it spread across the ancient world like wildfire, I'm going to tell you some some history of them because here's the thing. Um, If you want to get a sense of what the faith was really like, go back to the originals, right? Go back to the folks who are following right after Christ. And they were willing to do anything for him. They were willing to change their life anyhow. And so you had 12 original apostles, if you've studied this. And and one of those apostles was was Judas, and he died by suicide. So you had 11 left. Out of 11, 10 were martyred for their faith. Uh, The 11th one, John, he died in old age, and he survived that long, not because they didn't try to kill him, Early church history talks about ways that they actually tried to kill John and they were not able to, so they sent him into exile instead. And you'll see that at the beginning of the book of Revelation. But 10 out of 11 died for their faith. It was a hostile environment, yes? 
As Christianity was first being born and it came into this Jewish environment in Israel and Israel, of course, was under occupation by the Roman world. The Roman world was hostile against Christianity. And so I want to give you guys an idea for how that actually worked with these poor people and their faith. So um, Romans didn't like Christians and they didn't like Christians because they considered them atheists. If you read any of the historical documents, you'll see that a lot. Um, They would call them atheists. And and that might seem weird to you because they believe in Jesus, of course. But it's like, but to Romans, they believed in all these gods from all these cultures. And they had this viewpoint of, hey, we should be tolerant and worshipful of everything that's out there, especially the Roman pantheon of gods. And Christians would come along and say, but I'm not worshiping any of your gods because they're all false. I will only worship the one true God and Jesus Christ is his name. Amen? Amen. And so they looked at that and they're like, you're not believing in all these things that we believe. So they would call them atheists and they didn't like that. And there was a whole bunch of things about Christians that they didn't like. And so they brought persecution against them. Uh, One of the uh, main things that you'll see if you read the history on this is, is uh, when they would go to pay taxes, they would, they would walk citizens into a room and there would be a bust, a, a, a little statue of the head of the current Caesar, the current emperor who they considered a god. They considered the, uh, him a deity. And they'd expect them to pay their taxes and to walk up and they would take a pinch of incense and they would put it in the altar fire and they were expected to say the words, Caesar is Lord, which is calling him God because that's how they saw it. And when you did that, what you were doing is you were being a good citizen of the empire. You were expressing your loyalty to the leadership structure and and the military especially had to do this. And there was just one problem. The Christians couldn't. And the Christians couldn't. And, and, And when you did that, when you had that little moment with the incense and Caesar is Lord, they would give you a little certificate. Like this is all historically established, by the way. They would give you this little certificate, and I forget the Latin name for it, but this was your proof that you had done this. And Christians wouldn't. And so they'd throw them in jail, and they would take away all their possessions, and they would confiscate their scriptures and burn them. And if they found a church that was supporting this, they would burn the church down. And they would send many of them into exile or into slavery. They would, the, we, we got documentation, they would, they would take the daughters of these church families and they would put them into slavery in brothels. Like they would do all of this stuff and then they would kill them. And here's one slide that talks about this sedition that they saw in the Christian community. This is Burns and Jensen. These are two historians talking about the Decian persecution. They say Christian bishops and presbyters and deacons, these were church leadership. They were the ones that were executed immediately, right? Like cut off the head is what they were trying to do. High-ranking laymen were initially to lose their status and property and to be executed if they persisted being Christian Matrons, ladies, they were to be disposed of and exiled. Members of the imperial staff were to lose their property and sent to work as prisoners on agricultural estates. All you got to do is pinch a little bit of incense and say Caesar is Lord. Nobody's watching. It's no big deal. And the early Christians, (laughs) part of their problem is their Lord had died for them. His suffering led him to the cross. And the first generation of apostles, they had all stood for the good of Christ and for the good of others. And how is their death for the good of others? Because when people look from the outside and they, they see that you're not afraid of death for real. Death has no power over you. What does that start to do? Like that's a transcendent faith. Like, we may all believe different things, but this is something wholly different that's going on. Like, in Roman culture, like, courage was a big thing, especially in the military. Courage was a high value. But courage doesn't mean you don't care about death. The Christians are walking around, and they're they're giving their own death away like it means nothing. And how do you control a group of people like that? (laughs) You can't. How do you manipulate a group of people like that? You can't. And how do you explain it? Every onlooker that saw the testimony of that Christian knew that something different was going on here. 
When you look at the history books and the way that the church grew like wildfire in the ancient world, they saw something that they had never seen before. Nobody had high-definition video of the crucifixion of Jesus. Do you understand that? What did they have as proof? They gave their blood as proof. And that spoke volumes to people in a way that nothing else could. They, they just knew. They knew, as terrible as this might be, I'm going to close my eyes in death and I am going to open them to Jesus, saying, well done, good and faithful servant to me. Do you see how powerful that is? Amen. It's like, you actually believe it? Yeah, I actually believe it. And I'll put my life on the line for it. Uh, Pliny to Trajan, this is a Roman proconsul. He wrote to Emperor Trajan. He says, this is the course that I've adopted. I ask if they are Christians, if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and a third time, threatening capital punishment. If they persist, I sentence them to death for the inflexible obstinacy should certainly be punished. You see how annoyed he is? How dare they not do what we tell them? So one, one such person, his name was Polycarp. Say Polycarp. It's, it's a fun name to say, isn't it? Polycarp, St. Polycarp, they call him. Uh, Polycarp was a really unique individual in the early church because he was a disciple of the apostle John. So, so John, the disciple Jesus loved, wrote the book of John, wrote the book of Revelation, wrote the epistles of John. John's this amazing guy. John is the oldest living apostle and he actually had disciples himself. Polycarp was one of those. So once all the apostles had died, Polycarp was like the man, right? Because in the church environment, he's somebody who actually knew one of the apostles who actually walked with Jesus. Polycarp was awesome. And he was this church leader. He was this bishop. And he grew to 86 years old. And he could still walk around and bless every church that he talked to, that he knew John. And Polycarp was arrested by Emperor Marcus Aurelius in 166 AD when he was 86 years old. And all they wanted him to say was Caesar is Lord, and he refused. And this is what St. Polycarp said. He said, 86 years I have served Christ, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour so that in the company of martyrs, I may share the cup of Christ. And that word martyr there, by the way, it doesn't mean someone who died. It just means a witness. That's what the word means. To be a martyr is to be a witness. What are you witnessing? You're witnessing that the faith is true, that the faith transcends everything else that anybody else is doing. And Jesus is real. You're bearing witness to that with your life. Polycarp uh, was burned at the stake and run through with a spear. And many came to Christ. Uh, another uh, picture I'll give you is the plague of Cyprian. In the plague of Cyprian, this happened between AD 249 and 262, lasted a while. It was a, a vicious, vicious plague that hit the Roman Empire. Um, historians tell us that 5,000 people a day in Rome died. 5,000 a day died in just Rome. And then in Alexandria, one of their other major cities, historians say that before the plague started, there was 500,000 people in Alexandria. By the end of the plague, there was only 190,000 people left. 300,000 had died. That's how vicious this plague was. There was a, there was a moment where one of the um, bishops, his name was Cyprian, uh, he noticed that Anytime anybody would start to have symptoms, they would get abandoned, even by their families. And they were thrown out into the streets. They were thrown out of their house. They, they, were, they were sometimes cast out outside of the town because nobody wanted to get their disease. And so nobody was being, everybody was like for their own skin, right? So they're all self-protecting and, and the cruelty went up and the love went down. And that's just the way that it was happening because everybody was trying to just survive this thing. And so Cyprian, one of the Christian bishops said, hey, We've done this whole thing of being willing to put our lives on the line so that other people could find Jesus. Why would we allow this to happen now? If Christians care about people truly, we need to go to the sick. Even if that means we get their disease. Amen. 
And so here's what Eusebe said a few years later. He says, most of our brethren, through their surpassing love and brotherly kindness, being unsparing of themselves and clinging to one another, they fearlessly visited the sick and continually ministered to them, serving them in Christ, most cheerfully, this, uh, most cheerfully departed this life with the sick. Becoming infected with the affliction of others and drawing the sickness from their neighbors upon themselves and willingly taking over their pains. Just countless Christians died. But they died caring for others. Um, there was a famine in Armenia uh, around that time. Armenia is a, it would, would have been a, a country within Rome. Um, massive famine um, under Emperor, Emperor Max, Max, Maximinus, not Maximus, you gladiator friends, fans, Maximinus. Um, and what comes out of the writings about this famine is the Christians just went and helped everybody who needed food, needed resource. The churches just were mobilized. And they were mobilized so much, they did not hold back their giving to just Christian families. They gave it to pagan unchurched families as well. They didn't care. They were about loving other people and giving themselves away. And so yeah, there's, there's this really interesting thing that happened. Another emperor came along um, in the next generation. His name was called Julian the Apostate. And I love his name, Julian the Apostate. Um, and he decided that he wasn't going to persecute the Christians anymore because he had seen that the church just keeps growing too much every time you persecute them. And so he wanted a new strategy. So what he did is he took, he wanted to take all the resource, all the money, all the food in the Roman empire, and he wanted to give it to the Roman temples. And he's like, we're going to bolster our religion so that we grow past them. So anybody who needs food or needs anything, they've got to come to a Roman temple to get it. And he thought he would get a spiritual revival in the Roman religion as a result. And it didn't work. It didn't work. So look at his words. He says, these impious Galileans, this is 350 AD, he says this, these impious Galileans not only feed their own poor, but ours also, welcoming them to their agape. They attract them as children are attracted with cakes. So he's like, I can't beat them because they're giving to our, our people too. Anyway, wild stuff. All right, so that's three pictures. Here comes the fourth, the lapsy. Say the lapsy. The lapsy. Powerful. Um, I, I painted the picture for you that Christians were called to say Jesus is Lord. They would refuse and they would be imprisoned or killed. There are some Christians, as you can imagine, that struggled with that, yes. <laughs> and there are some Christians that when they were put to the test, um, they were not able to stand. And so some of them went ahead and said, Jesus, Caesar is Lord. And they spared their family. And others, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, the history books tell us they, they, um, some of them even bribed the officials and said, I'm not going to say Caesar is Lord, but I'm going to bribe you to say that I did. And give me the certificate that I need to be okay and to be legal. And of course, the church leaders had to come in and say, I'm not sure that bribery is any better than what you just did. And anyway, there was a whole, it was a whole thing. And, and there was such a, there was such a fervor in the church about all these people who are giving so much and giving their lives away that when this next group of people that lapsed faith, they called them the lapsy. When this lapsy group came along, many in the church were like, you're going to hell and you're not welcome back into the family of God anymore. Because other people have given up their life. How dare you not? And it became this big debate in the ancient church. What do we do with the lap sea? And, and the interesting thing that happened is there were a lot of Christians and they called them the confessors. The confessors, a lot of them were still in prison because they'd been put in prison. They weren't dead yet. And the confessors heard about this whole thing. And the confessors are like, hold on. Isn't the gospel of Jesus to show grace to those that need it? Amen. So why are we holding back the lapsy? Why are we showing them law when we're willing to die so that other people would find the love of Jesus? 
Why are we willing to give the love of Jesus to the pagans, but not to people inside the church? And the confessors became so loud about this, the bishops couldn't ignore them. Because if anybody had the authority to speak to this, it was them. They're in prison. They might die. And so the church came together and there was eventual unity and they were allowed back into the church, the lapsi. I love that little footnote. Um, so here's a quick summary. I talked to you about the early church, that they faced death. That's Polycarp. They loved the sick. That's the plague of Cyprian. Um, they were generous to outsiders. That's the famine of Armenia. And they showed grace to the lapsi. Um, Historians tell us that Christianity in 200 AD had a worldwide congregation probably of 218,000 people. That's how small they started. By 300 AD, the, the number of Christians was at 6 million in 100 years. How is that possible? Tertullian said, um, he's an early church father, he says, we are not a new philosophy, but we are a divine revelation. That's why we, you can't just exterminate us. The more you kill, the more we are. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Amen. So, okay, you get this history lesson. Um, hopefully that was enjoyable to you. <laughs> um, you step back from all of this. And some point this week, I had this moment where I'm just meditating all of this and I'm like, oh God, I'm a lapsy. Oh God, my faith doesn't look like their faith. There's something about them that it just doesn't even feel close to what many of us are doing today. It's almost a bad preaching strategy, honestly. I considered doing something different. Because it's like you've got the faith of the early church. I mean, this vibrant, transcendent, can't be stopped by death kind of faith. And we're asking questions like, does God understand if I give in to my addiction tonight? And I'm not trying to put that down or say that that's small. I'm just saying, like, there's such a difference, yes? Yes? There's such a difference, and it humbles me, and it rattles me. And what do we do with this? I think there's sometimes, too, a, there's a thought that might come in that, that says, well, why would God let these people die? Was he just trying to grow the church? No. That's a, that's a cynical question, and I'm the one who asked it, so you're welcome but it misses the heart of God. It misses the heart of God in the sense that his son was the first one in line who showed up and said, I will suffer for others. I will suffer and die and I will be the very first martyr of many. So there is no cold God in this picture. And, and, and do I believe it was some kind of a early movement growth strategy? Absolutely not. I think the church grow, be, grew because how could it not? Because when people are looking for something that's true, something that's real, something that transcends everything else that they see every single day, and then all of a sudden you see that, how do you not want that? How do you not want that? Do you want that? Does it draw you? Because it draws me. God, give me some of that. And go back to our previous question, like, like, does God just understand? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. And I'm not trying to be law to you guys. I'm trying to say, bring, bring yourself to Jesus and seek him. And when the world is different from the way of God, choose the way of God. And then fail and get grace and get forgiven, but choose the way of God. God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus for real. He does. And, and again, I know we struggle, but look at what Jesus said. 
This is, this is the faith of Jesus. Matthew 20, 28, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Like that's what Jesus called his purpose. He didn't come for himself. He came for other people. I was thinking about parents the other day and I'm like, you know, because I think this is where some of us kind of get screwed up with God is we see God as a certain kind of parent. We see the father in heaven as a certain kind of parent of us. And when we think, what's a loving parent look like? Ask yourself, what's a loving parent look like? I'm tempted to say it's the one who buys the biggest gifts for Christmas. Because they love their kids that much. And they're protective, maybe overprotective. And their kids may need to be released into to risk and life and potential suffering. They, they, no, let's not and keep you right here, right? Selfishly. And we're going to make it all about you. And if you don't agree, that's okay. That's your little idea. We'll just affirm you and your little idea, right? Because I love you and I want you comfortable. Don't we equate love with comfort? Especially when we want to receive it. And when comfort doesn't come, don't we feel an objection rise up in our hearts? Like, wait a second, where's love at? because I'm not comfortable right now. I'm in pain right now. No. We have believed somebody else's definition of what good parental love is, and it's wrong. Our Father loves us with the greatest love imaginable. And the greatest love imaginable from a parent is to say, I will not let you grow up all about yourself. I will not let you be the God of your own universe and expect everyone else to rotate around you. I, I, I will expect you to work and to strive and, and to suffer even for the good of other people so that your heart will turn over time and you will be about other people. Amen. I want that kind of parent. See, my father is good. My father is good. He's called us to not, not just be anybody. He's called us to be like Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, said to the crowd, if any of you wants to fo- be my follower, you must give up your own way. You got to take up your cross daily. Have you ever seen the word daily there before? He's like, you want to follow me? It's not about reading a book. Not by itself. It's about go find a cross. I've got my cross. Where's your cross at? And follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. Why don't you guys stand? We are the lapsy. Yes? Amen. Uh, None of you has a chance to follow Jesus, not really. You're not going to be able to pull it off. Only by his grace could you possibly. All the ways that you feel stuck and that I feel stuck, it's a mountain that we can't climb, brothers and sisters. We need his help and his grace every step of the way. Why did any Christian ever refuse to say Caesar is Lord and succumb to death? Only because the grace of God was there for them in that moment. Don't forget that. And if it was there for them in that moment, it's here for you in no matter what you're trying to let go of. We need him. Let's pray.